Hello and welcome to another episode of Mike and Dave's Hi-Fi Riff. I'm Mike Evans. And I'm David Price. And David, this week, what are we going to be talking about on our Hi-Fi Riff? It's a strange one this week, Mike. Um, it's the JBE Series 3 turntable. Now, I don't think there's going to be too many people who are familiar with JBE turntables. Um, so how about just a quick inf- quick introduction of, of this strange beast yes. which we're talking about today? Well, it is a very strange beast. And we were, we were sort of discussing how we were going to describe it. How do you uh, sum up this turntable in one sentence? And um, my, my one was um, uh, the Technics SL1200 uh, Mark I meets a Welsh slate mine <laughs> meets the Tomorrow People. <laughs> I, I can't do any better than that. I really can't. And I can see people now having to Google the Tomorrow People to work out what on earth that is as well. Yeah. Uh, but this is, I think, um, I can't decide whether it's one of the wackiest turntables I've ever seen in my life or one of the coolest. Yeah. Um, it's certainly either or. Um, I, I kind of like to think maybe a bit of both. Yeah, I think that's pretty fair summation, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. So it um, was a kind of he- he- heroic failure. I a think, heroic cause... failure. Uh, yeah, so. and that's and it's sad that it was a failure mm. because cause it's a belting, belting turntable. And and I know you are the, the proud owner of one. Oh, yeah. um, yeah. They did a couple of variants, yeah. didn't they? You, you didn't have to have the Welsh slate mine. No. You could have a wooden one. Or you could have a Perspex one. I don't think I've ever seen a Perspex one. Yeah. But, um, but, the, you're, but the slate one is the one to have. Yeah. A shadow yeah. of a doubt. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're talking, let's just, let's just frame this. We're talking, I think, around about 1978, aren't we? Yeah. So, yeah. so late, late 70s. Um, so the kind of music you'd have been playing would be, you know, Parallel Lines by Blondie, Kick Inside by Kate Bush. Um, uh, Saturday Night Fever, you know that kind of thing, yeah. isn't it? So, yeah. so sort of, um, you know, some 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 great music to play uh, on your on your turntable. Obviously, way before uh, you could get sort of CDs commercially, yep. which ironically is probably what killed this turntable yeah. off. Yeah. Ultimately, maybe we'll come to that in a minute. We will. Yeah. Um, but um, that year, that that 1978. Uh, was actually a really sort of pivotal point in the evolution of turntables, wasn't it? Because that was sort of getting at some critical mass yeah. for other manufacturers to start thinking about entering the industry, yeah. you know, like um, uh, like Roxanne, Pink Triangle, yeah. um, but also... Well, they they came a few years later A few later years later, on. yeah, they, they but did. They, absolutely, but the, the sort of genesis of those was happening at that was, time. It was a critical before, moment, wasn't it? Yeah. It really was. And it at was, the same time... It the, led to these, these turntables, yeah, didn't it? Yeah, it did. So, and also, the, the you know, at the same time, you had um, the Lin LP12 absolutely in the ascendant. Yes. It was, you know, if you read most of the UK hi-fi magazines back then, then there was basically one hi-fi, high-end hi-fi turntable that, that existed and uh, yes. it was made in Glasgow, wasn't it? Yeah, that's absolutely yeah. right. And, you know, their, their, their juggernaut of a marketing department was really kicking into gear, wasn't it? Yes. Um, and they were, they were redefining hi-fi, you know, the source being the most important point. Yeah. Um, I think the Lin at that time was just a smidgen under about £300 for its yeah. entry level, so it was £298 yeah, to be yeah. pedantic yeah. or something there. This came in cheaper. This undercut it by about a third, didn't yeah. it? So yeah, it was a, roughly two hundred pounds, I think, which was a lot of money. Yeah. Um, I think a Riga Planer three would have been about one hundred and fifteen at that time. There you go. Uh, something like that. Yeah. Um, so it was almost twice as much as a Riga, but it wasn't as expensive as a Lin. No, no. Um, and that, it, yeah. Well, I was going to say, arguably, that that was a, that was an interesting, possibly marketing strategy by JB because yep. they they knew how much Celin was knew it was the leader of the competition knew they couldn't over you know go, probably go past that 298 yeah but i don't reckon they made a huge amount of profit per unit on no. this turntable because it's 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 high end components isn't it yeah. you know and they they've got they got what they thought was the best direct drive at the time yep. the technics direct drive it was a, unit. a matsushita um uh, mkl uh, direct drive motor um, and that would was you know there were, there were plenty of direct drive motors around at that time. They were even appearing in in music centres by then in the turntables and music centres. So sure. direct drive was really sort of cut you know beginning to sort of uh, uh, make a, make an impact. Um, but the the JBE used the best. I think probably this 
second most expensive variant of the Technics direct drive motor, the SP10 being the, the most expensive. And it had um, probably better wow and flutter than the Lin. Yeah, I think it was um, uh, absolutely better than the Lin. Um, I don't know the exact figure, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it would... It was. Um, I think it would. It would be fair to say it measured better in terms of wow and flutter, and also rumble as well. It would have been quieter than the LP12. Sure. Um, and the the, yeah. the the slate was an interesting idea, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, I guess some other people tried to do the similar things. I'm thinking of Townsend. You know, with the rock later on, tried to use the base as a as a sink, get rid of any excessive vibration. Yeah. yeah. You know, Max Townsend was sort of um, quite fanatical about. Not yep. you know about getting rid of it you know as as as, as many of the uh, the outside noises as possible and also any yep. resonance created by the turntable itself yep. and was really onto something there. Um, but this 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 was very early on uh, uh, protagonist of doing this. Yeah, so it? it's so, very interesting because the JB not only used direct drive in a world of belt drives um, that it. it, it it didn't have a suspension system in the conventional way, in the way that a LP12 had, that a Thorin's TD160 had, or you know, the, the, any number of other sort of high-end or fairly high-end turntables, all used independently sprung sub-chassis. Mm -hmm. Was JB was basically a heavy bit of slate with a with a, 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 a Technics motor chucked in it, um, and that was it. And you had um, it had four little bouncy feet, which were. Um, an accessory made by Micro Seiki. Oh, um, gosh, they, I remember them. Yeah, yeah. They were mic Micro Seiki micro absorbers, and uh, you can actually buy them as aftermarket things to, to, to stick on your turntable, under wow. your turntable. for. A, I can't remember how much, but it's like £12 or something. Yes, <laughs> so, King's Ransom. Yeah, exactly. So get some Welsh slate, chuck four Micro Seiki micro absorbers under it, yeah. um, uh, stick a Technics direct drive motor in it, a very good one. And then have a bonkers podule platter, that uh, you know. So futuristic, it's, yeah. it's, it really is. Um, but also the other clever thing which they did was was they would give you options for different cutouts for arms. Yeah. So you know if you wanted a, a whatever arm, your SME arm yeah. or a Riga or whatever it may yeah. be, you know you could you could have you could fit the arm of your choice. Yes. Yeah. Um, which actually is quite a clever idea. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I quite I quite like their sort of their, their philosophy behind there. Well, it was very bespoke, definitely. Yes. And, in fact, with some arms, they'd even make the um, the, the the Welsh slate base larger so, to accommodate the arms. So, so cool, uh, isn't it? Yeah. Only only in British hi-fi would you get anything like that. Would exactly, you? It's, it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, um, and and I think that um, it, 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 it's uh, it's one of these really sort of sad stories. You know, you sort of you, you sort of almost alluded to this earlier uh, because. You want companies like this to succeed, yeah. But when you're up against sort of big marketing juggernauts like Lin, uh, you know, when you're up against the the oncoming of of CD, yeah. Uh, you know, when you are a small British industry, then it's really difficult, yeah. isn't it? Especially when you're buying in components and maybe even trying to, you know, engineer them at a price, yeah. Um, and not make much profit per unit, as we said, because you're trying to get a foothold in the market. Yeah. They never quite got there. Yeah, and it's sad, isn't it? So they become very niche. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you say engineering giants like Lin. I think you mean engineering giants like Ivor Tiefenbrunn. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> you know who was Lin the tour, of course, the tour de force of Lin. And you know, we both uh, met Ivor, and uh, he's quite a quite a, 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 a an experience, isn't he? He's yeah, a Ivor is yeah, incredibly yeah. charismatic guy, and yes. you know, uh, one of the reasons that the JBE didn't really gain traction in the market in seventy eight seventy nine is that. They didn't have an IVA. <laughs> so, um, you know, they, they, they had some degree of success. They sold through some dealers pretty pretty well and some magazines who weren't quite in the kind of spell of, under the spell of IVA, like Practical Hi-Fi, for example, um, did, uh, I think they did group tests and the JBE came out better than the LP12. In, yeah, interesting. In, 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 those, uh, in those magazines. So... Uh, and you know, many dealers would A B them, demonstrate them against. I would, have, I would have been really chuffed about that, wouldn't they? <laughs> Could you imagine? Yeah. My oh, gosh. So, uh, and I, I kind of, I, I get it completely because I think wasn't the story behind behind the LP12, uh, and maybe it's an urban myth. I'm not sure, but I think didn't either take a Torrens TD160 to pieces or something like that to find out how it works and then see if we can make it better. 
So yeah, I mean, I think you know, there's been lots of urban myths about the RP12. I mean, I you know, I think it's you know, um, I think it's basically a a Thorin's um, of you know maybe a 150 era Thorin's um, sort of reimagined and remade. And of course, there's the connection to Ariston, and you go on the internet, and it's full of uh, you know. Uh, sort of theories sure. about about that as well, but basically, it, it's it, I think it's a you know a a, a, a Scottish a British Thorin's bet that's made better, yes. um, you know, yeah. with a great bearing in it. But this isn't. No, this is this is let's make something that looks like it's going to go into outer space. Yes, you yes. know, and I yeah. love it for that. Yeah, and let's get a big bit of slate and just yeah. make it look as as cool as we can. Yes, we'll, we'll get a, an aluminium disc and put some acrylic podules on it, you know. And, These, uh, the, the, there's been a few turntables yeah. <laughs> since which have done the podule bit, haven't they? Yeah. You know, I'm thinking of uh, Michelle's done a few, Riga. Yeah, um, yeah well, the Riga, Riga planet, planet that came before, actually. Yeah, yes, and, um, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, the, the podule thing was very 1970s space sci-fi, wasn't it? It was. Um, and... Um, you know, again, the hi-fi purists didn't like it because they didn't offer the sort of as, as good a support to the record as a sort of old-fashioned uh, platter, uh, you know, with a kind of LP12 style felt mat or whatever. Um, it was pretty bonkers and um, probably didn't help the sound, but it made it look great. <laughs> it really does. Yeah. And it's funny because since we've been talking about this, like the sun's come out, it looks like we're just about to be teleported back into JBE territory, <laughs> doesn't it? Which is fantastic. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So the, the Tomorrow People is going to happen it, it, on it is. on your screen yeah. uh, thanks to the uh, uh, the sun. And if you don't know what we're talking about with Tomorrow People, you do need to Google it and watch yeah. it because it, be, it should be an important part of everybody's education. Well, so. Mike still watches episodes every day. So... <laughs> How did you know that? <laughs> Excellent. Um, sound quality wise today, I think, um, I, I would say that probably it, it would be, you know, like a good budget turntable, wouldn't it? Yeah, it, even better than that. I mean, it, it's not, it's, I don't think, it, I mean, I've had an LP12 and, and I know, you know, I've had many other turntables. It's not as good as an LP12, although it's not out of the game. It's, it has a different sound to an LP12. It's, I think it's more precise. It's it's a little more kind of it's more kind of on the Riga side, the sort of slightly thinner, less bulbous bass, and more slightly more analytical side. Um, but it sounds very good even today. And mine, my I've got a, a SME Series Three on my JBE Series Three, um, and uh, it sounds jolly good indeed. And as a retro deck, as a second-hand purchase, it, it's fantastic. It, yeah. You know, you can pick them up uh, for three, four hundred pounds, uh, which is just pennies, uh, I think, con, 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 uh, considering uh, you know what they are in terms of engineering. Mm. Uh, they're relatively easy to fix or to service. Uh, it's all sort of fairly basic DIY stuff, uh, and um, you know that they they, um, they have a nice sound. I think. I think that's that's fair to say. Smooth, uh, clean, and an open sound uh, that's much better than you would think uh, if you look at the the podules. You know what cartridge? <laughs> what cartridge have you got in yours? Um, so I've I've had a um, I've actually had a um, a Shure uh, V15 Mark IV oh, uh, okay. in mine. Um, okay. Because it matches the SME Series Three and the ultra yeah. low mass, yeah. uh, high compliance thing. Yes. Um, yeah, and it sounds fast and, and punchy and, uh, you know, and, and, and great. But, uh, you know, you don't have to have an SME Series 3 and a JBE. And there's plenty of people who put all sorts of things on them. And everything from a Dynavec to DV505 to Riga, you know, RB300 or whatever. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, uh, it, it's lots of fun and you can experiment. We forgot to mention my, my favourite named turntable of the same era, which is the Fonz. Yes. The Fonz SQ30, which absolutely. is just absolutely yeah. amazing, which yeah. actually is the opposite, isn't it? Because cause the JBE looks like it should be off, in, off into outer space, and actually the Fonz look quite dated even then. <laughs> so, um, and apologies to, to Fonz fans, uh, but I, I quite like that. That was quite a funky turn. Yeah. Because I remember listening to that. And, I think uh, that was Scottish, wasn't it? Um, it might have I been. I thought it was Irish. I was think that? it might be Irish. Okay, all right. But look, we, we have a comment yeah. section, and we, yeah. we, we're, also, yeah. we're, we're quite often... You know, corrected by our very knowledgeable hi-fi riffraffers. Yeah. And so, then there's my least favourite named turntable. Can you think of that, Mike? <laughs> I know where you're going it's with this. STD three hundred five. 
So uh, that's Strath Strathclyde transcription developments to Easy you. Easy for you to say. <laughs> so yes, uh, we had to we had to qualify it with the full name, didn't we? Yes, you so. wouldn't want to go down the pub and say I've just got an STD. No, so no. Uh, whereas and it's great. <laughs> whereas with the JBE, you, you you get away with it. Absolutely, so, yeah. absolutely. But there we are. Look, we 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 have our our, our hi-fi. Uh, retro riffometer. Yep. So, go on, give it your best shot. What are you going to give your gorgeous JBE uh, pod turntable? Eleven. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, ten. All right, ten. ten. Into the future. Yeah, Into exactly. Future. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, you've got to. It's too cool. Uh, and, and you know, really sad that they didn't sort of continue because it would have been fascinating to see if they're around today what sort of things they'd be making. So yeah. I just think they would just be he amazing. Heaven so, knows. Yeah, well, look, hats off to JB for doing such a great product. Um, if you can pick one up, then, you know, more power to your elbow. And it's, it's a super looking bit of kit. And it's definitely a dinner party conversation starter, isn't it? It is. Without yeah. a doubt. Yeah. And, look, and on that note, thank you for watching our episode of, of Mike and Day's Retro Hi-Fi Riff. And we'll see you at the next one. Thanks very much indeed. <laughs> STG. <laughs> <laughs> 